Welcome to the Jaco Report. I'm Charles Jaco. In 1995, Lida Cruzman's first husband was murdered in an attempted carjacking. Instead of fleeing the city, she stayed and was elected alderwoman in 1997. In 2003, she took out a second mortgage on her home to pay for an unsuccessful campaign against Missouri's concealed carry law. More than most of us, those incidents show, Cruzman has skin in the game to save St. Louis. In 2017, she became the city's first female mayor. She inherited a shrinking city set to drop below 300,000 population in the 2020 census, which would be the first time the city would have been that small since 1864. She also inherited control over a police force hammered by misconduct and brutality complaints and indictments, a city's budget so thin that even buying new garbage trucks was an effort, a murder rate placing St. Louis in the top 15 of the world's most dangerous cities, and a mostly African-American north side where mile after mile of crumbling buildings look like Fallujah after an artillery barrage. She's also in the forefront of some new initiatives, the growth of the Central Corridor's tech sector, a plan to demolish or refurbish wrecked buildings, a proposal to privatize the city's airport, and a plan to unify St. Louis City and County into one huge metro city. We're going to talk about that and a good deal more. Madam Mayor, welcome to the Jaco Report. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. That was a bit harsh, I thought. Which one? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, let's start with the police. You inherited a police department. In fact, you will be the first mayor whose entire tenure Charles. in office mm -hmm. is going to be where the city controls the police department. Correct. Recently, you have had four cops indicted by a federal grand jury. You've had 28 officers whom the circuit attorneys had lied so much their word can't be trusted in court documents, forbidden from bringing any new cases in. You've had two cops charged with shooting up a guy outside of a south side bar, and you had the recent case where one officer allegedly killed another officer in a bizarre game of Russian roulette. In addition, in terms of a functioning law enforcement agency, you've got a city police department that makes arrests in about half of the city's murder cases. With all due respect, that would indicate to an outside observer that you are now in charge of a police department that is either dysfunctional or has a ton of problems systemically that need to be corrected. How, right. how do you deal with that? I think what you do is you deal with that. And you each one of these situations has a different background and a different story to it. But what citizens should feel good about is that we are dealing with these situations as they come up. And some of these actions were taken before the current chief was even the chief. And uh, so I think that it's very important that internal affairs, that uh, it does take action when it's warranted for officers who, who aren't uh, living up to the standards which we expect them to live up to. The other thing about that is that uh, it doesn't mean that all 1,200 of our police officers are having issues. What it means is that a few officers are having issues, and we're dealing with that, and most, the vast majority of our officers are going to work every day, doing what they should be doing, and honoring the badge. Systemically, do you think you've got a problem in the police department? Because in addition to those cases, of course, we have the numerous lawsuits that have been filed mm -hmm. for alleged uh, police brutality, especially in protests. It would seem that while each incident only may involve a few officers, two officers in the Russian roulette case, two officers in the shooting the guy outside the bar, 28 officers in the uh, Kim Gardner circuit attorney mm -hmm. case, four officers in the federal indictments. Mm -hmm. After a while, that starts to add up. You get individual case after individual case. But isn't the common thread there that there may be something wrong systematically with the St. Louis Police Department that allows these things to happen? Well, I think certainly each officer has to take responsibility for their own behavior. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is, that's a very important issue here. We can't hold other res officers responsible for the behavior of those that have now been charged or investigated. So you think these are just individual one-off cases? They don't point to anything larger within the police department? Well, I think that certainly, and I know the police department is doing this, you, when these situations arise, you, you look at, well, how are we recruiting? How are we supervising? So you look at all of those things to make sure that you have adequate uh, issues in place in order to deal with this. Do you think you've got a problem with racism in the St. Louis Police Department? That's certainly what the 
uh, black officers organization, the Ethical okay. Society of Police would say, mm -hmm. and it's certainly with what a lot of protesters mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. say, and it's certainly what the off-duty, uh, the undercover officer, rather, who was beaten by the other four in the federal indictments, <coughs> would say that with a lot of white officers in this department, you've got a serious problem with racism. I think St. Louis has an issue with racism. And uh, our police department is likely reflective of St. Louis. And when I say an issue, we, you know, we just released something called the Equity Indicators Report. It was released uh, right, up, right about the end of the year. And what it shows is that there are uh, predictably different outcomes, whether it's health outcomes, whether it's job opportunities, whether it's uh, the opportunity to create individual wealth. Those outcomes are predictably uh, controlled by race. And uh, so we have a lot of work to do here, educational system work, work in terms of making sure that folks have opportunities, and, and that's what we're doing. The abandoned building situation in, in the north part of the city, you mentioned racism being a problem in, in St. Louis. A lot of critics of your predecessor, Francis Slay, used to say that he thought the city limits, the north city limits were at Delmar. They said his administration completely ignored the north side. If you go through the north side, you've got block after block of literally bombed out, burnt out, mm -hmm. decrepit, falling mm -hmm. buildings with families and children mm -hmm. uh, in them. I mean, how do you feel as mayor when, when you go through that part of the city and it, yeah. and it looks like a Middle Eastern city that's been caught in a war? Well, you know, that was one of the things that I actually campaigned on, which was uh, too many vacant buildings. I like to say it like this, nothing good happens in a vacant building. And so on day one, we began developing a vacancy initiative. And it means a lot of things. One, we want to save any buildings that we can that we can be renovated. And we want them to be reoccupied. But the city of St. Louis, we have about 120,000 parcels in total in the city. Of them, 25,000 are vacant. Now, stay with me here. Of the 25,000, about half are privately owned and about half are owned by LRA, Land Reutilization Authority. So that's the city. And of that 2,500, 7,500 are vacant buildings. So that means we've got 7,500, give or take, vacant buildings that in the city. That are the property of the city. <clears throat> 3,500 the property yeah. of the city, or 3,400, and the rest are privately owned. But the point here is this. We believe that we have to focus on the vacant buildings. So last year, for the first time, we budgeted $4 million in demolition money. In addition to that, we brought together the, uh, some of the construction companies, Fred Weber, Alberici, Keeley Companies, BSI, uh, McCarthy, and worked with them on five Saturdays a month to take down some of these buildings. In 2018, we took down 313 buildings. We have another 270 that have been bid out that will be taken down and, and more to come this year. We absolutely agree that we have to, first of all, focus on what I call the worst first, the worst buildings first. And then we need to take a really strategic approach to trying to go through neighborhoods and clean an entire area so that we can have development come in behind it, but also so that those folks that are still living there aren't living next to these vacant buildings. So we use it as a jobs program. Uh, we want to recycle the brick. We want to recycle the wood. It's going to take a bit in order to do this. Last Friday, I was in Baltimore. Very similar problem, a lot bigger problem than we have. Uh, but looking at how they are doing their vacant buildings. So we are working both on the demolition side of things and also on the preservation side of things with Prop NS, which is a, a tax issue that was on the ballot a couple years ago that will provide money to stabilize. That mo mostly means roofs, tuck pointing, gutters in order to keep water out of buildings to stabilize those buildings that can be stabilized. And then maybe we'll get you to buy one or one of your viewers here today. I was going to ask, well, then the, you've, you can tear them down or stabilize them, and all mm -hmm. you've done there is manage decline. How do you manage to get people back into those right. buildings? I notice there's a program of selling some off for you know right. a few bucks on the dollar, and then you've right. got to rehab them. Are, is there anything in the works to try to get people who live in those neighborhoods the financing so they might be able to actually mm -hmm. buy a property in mm -hmm. their own neighborhood rather than waiting for newcomers to say, oh, yes. I think I'll buy this. Absolutely. There are a couple things going on there. One, 
We have 500 buildings right now that are on the $1 building program. They are buildings that are about 1,500 square feet, and they've been in LRI's, LRA's inventory for five years. Uh, you have to have a bit of a capacity to do something. So you either need to be able to do some work yourself or have, get some financing in order to do that work, buy one of those buildings and own it for a dollar, plus what you have to put into it to bring it up. So that's one program. The other program that we have is what's called a moda own program. Now this is a side lot program because there are a lot of vacant lots. If you're living in a house, there's a lot next to you owned by LRA. If you'll mow it for two years, you can own it. And that's, really? Yes. If you'll mow it for two years, you can own it. Uh, and that is a way to, one, get somebody mowing the grass for, uh, you know, in perpetuity, but also to give you a nicer lot. City lots are narrow. Most mm -hmm. of them are 25 or 30 feet wide. Uh, and when you have a side lot, maybe you'll have a garden. Maybe it's a place for your kids to play. Maybe it's just, uh, maybe it's just flowers. But yes, so we have the Mow to Own program. In your mind, what is the single biggest impediment to getting St. Louis's population to increase rather than bleed off several thousand every year as it's been doing for over half a century? I mean, is there one thing that stands above others? Is it crime? Is it the education system? Uh, racism? I mean, what would you say would be that prevent people? all of those things because those things are all related. So yes, certainly there's uh, the public safety issue that we have, but that's related to education, and that's related to job opportunities. That's related to prevention versus just law enforcement. So you really have to do all of that at one time. Now, there are several reasons why, you know, families are a lot smaller today than they were. St. Louis homes and buildings were built for families with five, six, eight, nine, ten kids. Well, no one has ten kids anymore, almost no one. And so part of the population decline that you see in all Rust Belt cities is that they used to just be a lot more people in a family unit. So some of it, some of it is that. One of the things that you will see is that there are a lot more young people, uh, so 18 to 30, 18 to 32, how they measure it. There are a lot more young people that are choosing to live in the city of St. Louis. They choose to live here because we have great neighborhoods. Um, and you can look at that as you drive around. That doesn't mean we don't have issues in, in many places, but what it does mean is there are a lot of good reasons to live here. People want to live in a community. They want to know their neighbors. They want to be able to walk to the coffee shop or walk to, take their dog on a walk to a park. We have a lot of great neighborhoods here, and we have a lot of young people that are joining us here in the city of St. Louis. One of the big initiatives that's out there right now that everybody's talking about, of course, is taking the city of St. Louis, the county of St. Mm -hmm. Louis, merging them or uniting them into mm -hmm. one sort of mega city of mm -hmm. roughly 1.3 mm -hmm. right. million people. Um, why do you think this is not only something good, mm -hmm. but why do you think it might be necessary given the fiscal mm -hmm. realities and demographic right. realities of the city and, and the county? Well, I think it's necessary because right now we spend a lot of time fussing among ourselves. Um, and I, when I say that, I mean elected officials, neighbors. We're chasing that almighty sales tax dollar. We fuss about whether a Walgreens should go in uh, Afton or the city of St. Louis or University City. Um, that is really very counterproductive for us because the competition should be out there. The competition should not be between Wildwood and Hazelwood and Afton and the city of St. Louis or Clayton and the Central West End. That's not our competition. That's a family fuss. Competition should be between St. Louis and Louisville, St. Louis and Nashville, St. Louis and Indianapolis, or Kansas City, or Austin, or Denver, or, or the world, frankly. And when we have 88 municipalities, we have 55 police departments, I think it's 78 municipal courts, um, that creates a competition among or between ourselves. It's not healthy for growing the economic development of our region. So that's just one of the items. What would be your bumper sticker to sell this to skeptics? Because well, living in St. Louis County, I mean, if I had to guess, I would guess if it was just put up to a vote in the county, it would probably def be defeated uh, overwhelmingly. And part of that, and you know it and I know it, is just racism. Part of it is because a lot of people move to St. Louis County to get away from black people and they do not want mm -hmm. the city mm -hmm. following them. How do you make a legitimate 
economic case mm -hmm. to people who are the white flight folks who look as some sort of unification as bringing the problems of the city mm -hmm. to their doorstep. Well, I don't, I don't look at it like that at all. And what I think is that here we are in a few hundred square miles. The city of St. Louis is 62 square miles. So in a few hundred square miles. And if you don't think what happens in the city of St. Louis affects your life in Chesterfield or uh, South County or North County, I think you're badly mistaken because these, these are all of our neighbors. And what we need to do is attract business here, more business, more jobs, more opportunities, and we need to make it easier for the businesses who we have here now to grow. But and it, I think that, that will happen when we are less fragmented. Given the economic <clears throat> and racial polarization of this region, though, do you think an economic argument like that is enough to carry the day? I think that the good people of the city and county of St. Louis know that what we are doing now is not working as well as it could. Um, and that we really ought to try something different. And I think that something different is to be able to come together and try to solve our uh, issues and try to grow our community, our whole community, together. Um, and it's partly economic development, certainly. But it's also um, just the way we're going to help one another out. Given that this would go to a statewide vote because a state mm -hmm. constitutional amendment mm -hmm. would be required, given that there's still a lot of town hall arguments and, and you know, things mm -hmm. to go along, what do you think the consequences, would the consequences be should this fail for whatever reason that the voters mm -hmm. reject it or the idea is dropped mm -hmm. and we continue the way we are 88 municipalities in the county the city of st mm -hmm. louis both either stagnant or or <coughs> losing mm -hmm. population where if this fails where do you see the city and the region at in say 20 years you know i don't spend a lot of time thinking about when this fails i spend a lot of time thinking about how to make this happen and how to move this forward. And what I say to people all the time is think out. Think out 10 years. Try not just to think about next year or the year after. And think about what might have happened had we done this 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Maybe we wouldn't have some of the outcomes that we're having today. And so I ask people to take a broader look and to think out into the future, to think out for your kids and my kids and our grandkids and what kind of community they are going to live in. And I think St. Louisans will do that. I have a lot of confidence in St. Louisans. You know, I'm out and about all over this community. And while pe there are people that are worried, okay, when this change makes us anxious, all of us. We're all worried, but we, we can lean forward on this and come together as one community to try to uh, address the situations. Well, the corollary would, of that would be if you're asking people to look 10 or 20 years down the road as to mm -hmm. what the benefits could be, mm -hmm. there's also got to be a warning attached, doesn't it? If you don't do this 10 mm -hmm. or 20 years down the road, here's what the outcome is going to be. And, and I guess I'm wondering, you know, all right, things in your mind would get better 10 to 20 years from now if this passes. Or, or, or 5 to 10. It, but I take yes. it the flip side would be, <laughs> things are going to get worse if it doesn't pass. Well, pass. I think there's some evidence that we are not keeping up with other areas, with other metropolitan areas. We are an old Rust Belt city, and we made the decision back in uh, 1876 to split. And from my reading, it looks like by about 1900, folks had regretted that decision. And there have been five or six major efforts since then to bring us back together, but it's never really happened. And uh, I, I just think it makes great sense, not just economically, but the way we feel about each other. And don't forget, the municipalities, and I, I understand, I live in the Central West End. Uh, my daughter lives in Tower Grove South. Uh, I have friends who live north and south, and we all identify with our neighborhoods, and that's a really good thing. And St. Louis County, those municipalities will stay in place, and they'll continue to identify with their neighborhoods, too. Whether it's Kirkwood, or whether it's Jennings, or Florissant, or Chesterfield, those neighborhoods are still going to exist. 
But if we are able to come together, we will have one police department over the entire area. Of course, there will be police stations all over, all over the area, but there'll be one police department. That police department will have standards, standardized training, same laws to enforce, a much more consistent policing. And we know from four or five years ago, when we had the situation with Michael Brown, and that brought to us, brought to the front of our minds, the situations with municipal courts, we know that there's a very uneven uh, policing and uneven municipal courts now. And, and I think that almost everybody agrees that that should be more standardized. Shifting gears for a moment, uh, the, the issue of privatizing Lambert International mm -hmm. Airport has, mm -hmm. has been a front and center. Are you in favor of that? I don't know if I'm in favor of it because we don't have any proposals yet. What I am in favor of is exploring the idea. I'm in favor of finding out what, what could Lambert look like? Could we have more flights to more places more often for both people and freight? Freight's a big deal. Um, just all those packages that show up on your porch, well, they get there somehow, right? So that's freight. And uh, so I am interested in exploring whether or not one of the companies who runs airports around the world, very common in Europe, as you know, about half the airports in Europe are already privately operated. Can one of those companies bring something to the table uh, and can we learn from them? Can they do a better job than an entity, St. City of St. Louis, that operates one airport? in the whole world. So well, I'm interested in looking at it. What would the time frame on that be, do you know? Well, we hope within the next couple of months that we will have a request for qualifications and RFQ out, because we'll qualify who is able to propose on this. And so I am hopeful that by the end of 2019, we would have some proposals in hand that would allow us to evaluate whether or not we want to go down this path. But big, a lot of work left to do. Final question for you. One of St. Louis's longer term problems has always been that we are unable to attract and keep talented young people here in the city. Our major educational institutions produce them, they leave. There's been a certain amount of turnaround with the, the, mm -hmm. the revival the, with the tech corridor in, in the central mm -hmm. corridor, but longer term, mm -hmm. what what do you think it would take to not only attract more of those people, but to keep them in the city right. once they have kids of school age? Right. Well, I think a, a number of things. One, we are attracting more young people to stay here. Uh, drive around the city and you'll see young people in, in every ward and in every neighborhood because they want to live in an urban environment. They want to know their neighbors. Secondly, though, we, there are a number of things. Schools are very important to young families. So St. Louis Public Schools is recently accredited and then re-accredited. That's good. We have some good options in St. Louis Public Schools. We also have about 11,000 kids going to charter schools. Charter schools have been a good choice, a good option for many families. And a lot of those young people are sending their kids both to the good St. Louis Public Schools and to charter schools. So we know schools are very important. But they also need uh, job opportunities. And what we, ha we have over 5,000 people today working in Cortex. Take a look at a program like Arch Grants. You familiar with Arch Grants? Right. Arch Grants is a program. You apply. You have an idea. You're an entrepreneur. You've got a startup business. You apply to Arch Grants. Give you $50,000. Your business has to be located here in St. Louis. And they give you some support, meaning uh, business advice, legal, accounting. That has been very productive in terms of bringing companies and young people, they're not all young, but many are, uh, here to St. Louis. So I think there's no one answer to any of these important issues that you bring up. All of these issues, just like vacancy, when I talked about all the different things that we're doing, all of these issues have to be attacked from multiple sides. Mayor Lyda Cruz. And Madam Mayor, thank, thank you. you very much for coming Appreciate in. It. it was my thank pleasure. You. Our thanks to the mayor and our thanks to you for joining us. We'll see you right here next week for another edition of the Jacob Report.